Welcome to Inside the Hype.tv podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Umberto Bon Cristian. In this podcast, we talk about the teachings of the most successful society in natural history, the honeybees. It doesn't matter if you're a beginner and an advanced beekeeper or just curious about honeybees. Here, you'll find great conversations to educate and entertain yourself about this wonderful insect. From honeybee biology to how to make money with honeybees, you won't miss anything here. Inside the Hype.TV podcast is brought to you by our fans on Patreon. On Patreon, you can access all episodes before anybody else and exclusive content, like behind-the-scenes videos, live streams, and more. If you want to learn more about honeybees and help me to make more content about honeybees to everybody, please visit patreon.com slash inside the hive TV and join our community. All right, all right, everybody, it's good to be back. Please let me know in the chat room if everything is working and where are you tuning in, where are you tuning from? I want to know where you are. We have a lot of people from all over the world and it's always good to know my people, the community. So today episode is a special one to me because I'm going to have the pleasure for the first time to bring a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Mohamed Alburaki. Dr. Mohamed, he is a research scientist, uh, entomologist at the USDA ARS uh, and in Beltsville, Maryland, very close where I live here in Maryland. And he just published a very interesting article about the current situation of the genetic diversity of honeybees in the United States that got my attention. And I said, well, this is a very important subject for all the beekeeping community. That's a good discussion to have live with Mohammed. So let me bring Mohammed so we can start this conversation. Mohammed. Welcome to the show. How are you, my friend? Long time no see. Hi, Humber. Yeah, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. So we have a lot of people here already, Mohammed. People from New Zealand, people from Connecticut, uh, Atlanta, ev everywhere. So people are coming in, Maryland. Uh, Mohammed, I want I want to start this conversation actually talking about you a little bit because you have a very interesting history with bees. And if you could share uh, your trajectory, how you get where you are today studying bees, that would be great so people at home can know you a little bit better. Okay. Well, hi, everyone, and thank you very much for um, being online. Thank you, Humberto, for your nice invitation to present our part of our work on honeybees. Uh, so basically, just to give you a short summary, since th this is really my first time on, on the podcast, is that uh, my name is Mohammed al -Buraki. Currently, I am a, a honeybee scientist at the Beltsville Bee Lab at the USDA, Maryland. Uh, since 2019, I started with the USDA. Um, before that, uh, I am uh, from Syria originally, and I am a second generation beekeeper in my family. Um, so I grew up in Syria. Uh, I was born in Syria. I grew up in France. Um, and then I came back to Syria and I did my bachelor degree in agriculture sciences. Uh, since uh, I've been raised with bees, my father was a beekeeper and was a professor at the University of Damascus teaching beekeeping. Uh, so I was very close to the problem that we are facing uh, worldwide, uh, that the bees are facing and the beekeepers as well. Uh, but I've always wanted to really go, I mean, I, I've always been fascinated by the honeybee behavior in general, uh, but I have a particular interest in the genetic diversity of the bees. Uh, because while I was traveling here and there, you see this beautiful diversity that we have between uh, North uh, uh, North Africa, South, Syria, also the Middle East. When you go to Europe, completely different uh, subspecies that we have, uh, different color, different sizes. Uh, so it was it was this this. Uh, and when you go south to Saudi Arabia, Yemen, you have you face like Yemenetica, uh, and their behavior is completely different. Their phenotype is different. Uh, so I start to study on, on that um, to to um, gather more information on, on, on that particular aspect. 
Uh, and this what brought me really to the um, genetic diversity uh, of the bees uh, in terms of studying that and understanding that in, in more depth. Uh, then I did my master degree um, in France. Uh, my training, I did it in France on um, molecular biology on the genetic diversity of the bees in the CNRS in uh, gif sur a uh, town south of Paris. Uh, my supervisor, I'll speak a little bit about him in my presentation because he, he was the one who uh, discovered and established the molecular marker we've used in, in that study. Uh, and uh, I followed a PhD with a PhD in the same domain. Uh, basically, my major uh, subspecies was Syriaca, but I studied also European subspecies and North African subspecies too during my PhD. So uh, from background, I'm really a honeybee geneticist. Uh, so I did my PhD at the same lab at the CNRS from the University of uh, Pierre, Pierre and Marie Curie. And then I started my first postdoc in Canada where I shifted gear a little bit. Uh, we had at that time in 2011, a lot of uh, funding for addressing the, the problem of the excessive use of pesticide and, and neonicotinoids precisely. So I did a postdoc at the University of Laval, uh, Quebec City, uh, for two years in which I've studied how the neonicotinoids are affecting um, honeybee colony performance in the field. And I was particularly interested on the corn, um, uh, corn fields mainly. Uh, then I moved to the U.S. in 2014 for my second postdoc at the University of Tennessee. And that was a very productive postdoc for three years, uh, where I worked on uh, the effect of landscape composition and the agriculture pesticide in general on honeybee colony performance. Um, and then finally, I moved for a short postdoc where I studied the effect of non-metal um, element uh, and honeybee uh, and the the, 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 uh, non, the um, abiotic stressors, how they affect bees for a year and a half at the University of Southern Mississippi. And in 2019, I moved to the USDA and I joined the Beltsville lab. So this is basically a short summary of my um of my work with bees and science and this type of things. That's why I, I, I like your story because you were able to see a lot of diversity in different bees, which is something that is not all of us have that opportunity to see bees all over the world. And I, I feel that it, it, that enrich us so much to see different things uh, when we are analyzing other people's problems. For example, I am always very skeptical to open my mouth until I really have a full comprehension about the environment, the bees, the genetics. So yeah, I, I like your story very much, Mohammed. It, it's very good to, to learn from you today. Thank you for being here today. So let's talk about the genetic diversity of honeybees here in the United States. I will put some of your slides here. Let me let me put this on. Then I it, can you give us a little overview about that particular paper. And then we start the discussion and discuss what's the pros and cons, if there is any pros on that, at least that's in my opinion, I want to know yours. So can you give us an overview, please? Yeah, sure. So I compiled very simple slides about uh, this specific study, as well as other, other studies, because um, when, when you talk about the genetic diversity, you need to compare you know, things together to be able to understand the scope of what, what you are tackling. Uh, this is why I really put those simple slides together. And uh, I think they would be, uh, hopefully your audience also will, will agree with me, they will be very informative. We'll see at the end, otherwise they will curse us, but uh, this is uh, oh, don't <laughs> to worry. the they, audience. They, they have no filters, <laughs> don't worry. Don't worry about that. That's why okay. I like live things. I like live yeah, things, no, there is no filters, there is no such thing. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want filters because uh, we like to speak with beekeepers. We are, yes. I mean, we are all beekeepers and we like to, 
shake things to be able to to uh, yep. get better and understand the novel technology we have in the field and apply that to our businesses. So basically, um, the the ma- the major thing to understand when we talk about honeybees, usually we take our colonies for granted. Uh, when we go to the backyard, we open the, the bees, but I, I always try to emphasize on the fact that the bees in our boxes, in fact, they've evolved for 50 million years. To, so it took time and evolution and process to, to see what we see in those boxes, regardless of the subspecies. The subspecies is a degree that is like very minimal, if you want. It's at the end of the, of, of the, of the scale of evolution. And nowadays we count four evolutionary lineages, maternal lineages. They were established using morphometrical tools by Reutner in 1988. And a lot of all of them, they were confirmed with molecular markers because at the beginning we didn't have molecular markers. We used to see, okay, those 45 characteristics that Rittner, Rittner is the godfather of uh, the honeybee uh, genetics and honeybee diversity, I would say, uh, because he traveled everywhere uh, around the world and he was like describing what he's seen. Uh, and exactly talking about the diversity, you, you were just mentioning um, uh, Humberto at the beginning. He was able to see these differences, whether it is a phenotype, phenotype difference or in the behavior or et cetera. Uh, but those, they were confirmed with molecular markers. And now we know uh, with both the morphometrical markers and the molecular markers that we have identified 33 different subspecies. Now, those numbers are not like the evolutionary lineages. In some instance, you have six, some instance, five, four. But here I, I was a little bit like I talk uh, conservative. We have four lineages that are confirmed with both markers. Uh, similarly, the, the subspecies, because they, they live together, they, you've got like introgression zones between them and they, they, uh, they enter exchange. But we count 30, 33 uh, different subspecies. And that's impressive, in fact, worldwide. Now, to jump straight to it, the marker that we've used, we used two different markers in, in, that, uh, in that study. And not only that study, I'll show you other studies. Uh, this marker is widely used. Uh, in 1993, this gentleman who happened to be my PhD supervisor, Dr. Lionel Garnery, in fact, established that marker. The beauty of this marker is that this marker is targeting the mitochondrial DNA of the bees. And this is the area where he found that marker. It's an encoding area, non-coding area. Uh, in our study, we used also a coding gene just to double confirm and double check our data to, to make sure that what we are seeing in that genetic area, which is non-coding here, uh, is identical, or at least it's bringing us the same information that we have from the, the dehydrogenase subunit 2 or the ND, ND2. Um, so this is important to keep in mind. So uh, what Lionel did, in fact, is that he noticed that this, the length of this, to make it simple, the length of this intergenic region is tracking down the history of evolution of the bees, which means in a simple way, uh, if you go to Europe, it will have a different length. If you go to Africa, it will be longer. Uh, if you go to another area, you will have differences or, or insertion or deletions in, in that region. So the polymorphism basically of this region, using the polymorphism of this region, he was able to characterize subspecies, uh, subspecies of bees. So basically, he saw that the Italian bees, they have different polymorphism than the uh, Carniolan bees, than the African bees, than Scutellata, et, and et cetera, than Syriaca and other, other uh, subspecies. And this what rendered, in fact, this marker very powerful because it's amazing to have a marker that is well-determined, relatively easy to use, and can give you a decision whether this lineage or maternal lineage of these bees the mother is mainly Italian or of origin or, or, or European or African, etc. And this marker is called CO1, CO2 marker, or you can see it in the paper, draw one uh, mtDNA, CO1, CO2 test. Um, so we use that test and this test was used, was like intensively used because it's so convenient. 
by many, many scholars, many articles, many papers. But here I just cite, I'm citing a couple of our paper when I was um, uh, doing my PhD with Lionel. Uh, we worked on Syriaca, Meda, Carnica, just a couple subspecies, uh, Ligustica, Melifera, and Intermisa from North um, Europe, from Algeria precisely. We did also a study from, and many other people have used that marker. And this marker will allow you to determine something that we called haplotypes. So haplotypes is is very interesting. It, th this is this is the main the main topic of of this uh, presentation, in fact. But before that, just to give you some background to be able to compare our study with something, because when we talk about okay, we have a low uh, haplotype diversity, uh, what does it mean? You need a comparison, you need a number, or you need an estimation. Uh, here is a review that was done uh, fr from France that was done on the black honeybees, um, Epis mellifera, mellifera, in fact, um, in France. And uh, the, the objective of that paper was to group all the previous data we had because it was a nightmare. To, we have like, we had haplotypes on everywhere, many papers, but we don't have a comprehensive article that will give us the, the pattern, the polymorphism of those haplotypes, as well as their sequence. So uh, uh, Agnes uh, conducted that paper. I co-authored it with, with her and other, and other authors. But basically here is to put things into perspective. Look, in France, uh, we identified 91 different haplotypes, mainly on the black honeybee, Epis mellifera mellifera. So, so keep, keep this in mind, like 95 haplotypes. The, when we talk about, about genetic diversity, we always have to look at, this, at, at the, the, the geographical map. Uh, where are those 95 haplotype, uh, haplotypes located? In fact, in France, uh, I remember they've sampled south, north, Montpellier, Marseille, going to the north. But the size of France, whole country, is smaller than the size of Texas as a state here in our country, in the US. And France, basically, according to what I've seen on Google, quickly I Googled it, France is the size of two Colorados uh, in terms of geographical um, 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 distance. Uh, so why this is important, this is because you need to compare apple with apple. So uh, there we have like uh, France, the size of, let's say, Texas, and we have there and that population uh, 91 haplotypes on on that on their native subspecies. Now, my study in Syria, Syria is the size of Washington State, much smaller. See, I identified on Syriaca, Syriaca, the natural area of repartition of of, of Epis mellifera Syriaca, a very very beautiful uh, subspecies and very well adapted to the climate in, in, in Syria, which is usually hot and, and dry in some area, and especially in the Palmyra Desert in this area. And it, it connects with the territory of Epis uh, Mellifera Meda. Me Meda is here, in fact, you see, while Syriaca is really covering uh, the, the up to the Mediterranean uh, Sea, and it goes down and it will merge with Lamarki in Egypt here. But basically, in the superficy of, of, uh, of Syria, we, I've ident identified 27 uh, haplotypes. Now, the geographical area of Syria is, as I said, um, the size of Washington uh, state. Okay, so 27 haplotype here, there are 91. Now, uh, worldwide, what's going on? Uh, what do we have? We need to, we need to, we need to see what what do we have in terms of, of different subspecies uh, of the world? Now, uh, in Europe, we count 13 different subspecies. I've just put the main one, you know. Uh, this is the M lineage. It's spread to France, um, Portugal, and, and Spain. And then you have in the Central Europe and South e uh, East Europe, you've got the lineage C or the North Mediterranean lineage. This is, we call it the West Mediterranean. You've got the African continent. They have 11 uh, different subspecies. And you've got the O lineage, the Oriental lineage. We have nine. And the question we ask ourselves, okay, what do we have in the U.S.? So we know that we've been importing bees to the U.S. for 
uh, the last uh, 300 years, 400 years. And we, ha- we, we have like a, a pretty interesting record of, of what has been imported. But what we, what we hear nowadays here in the U.S. is that, okay, I've got Italian, I've got Carniolan bees, Russian, we have queen lines, uh, VSH lines, and beekeepers will, say, will always claim most of the time, my bees are excellent, you know. Uh, so, uh, so, but but that is not really scientific material. We want to really know what is going on here in the U.S. And we had some study studies before um, in 1993 to 2005. They were conducted on some small areas, especially during the Africanized area, uh, uh, the Africanized period of time, uh, but in in very particular states. So what we did in our study basically is that we, with the collaboration of the University of Maryland uh, and Dr. Dennis Van Angels Dorp, uh, we've collected sample from the um, National Honeybee Survey and we've collaborated with Dennis. So he provided us with this beautiful uh, sampling from across states and across the U.S. and some of the territories. And... um, we decided to do a screening to see, okay, we want to know nationwide what is the status of the diversity of the bees, what lineages we have, uh, what haplotypes we have. And that is very interesting uh, because once we have like a clear picture of what's going on, we can identify if there is a problem or no, or we're good, we're good to go or not. So basically, uh, that was approximately 20 to 24 uh, sample from every state, but each sample originated from a single beekeepers. So they are very well scattered, those points, okay, per state. So they are not from the same person. So they really represent, if we, if we take South Dakota, for example, they mainly are 20 uh, bees belonging to, to 21 different beekeepers. Uh, and this is what is very important for us because we want to have our point scattered across the state as much as possible. Now, nothing is perfect. Sampling is under the the law of the random sampling of statistical analysis that usually uh, you take a random sampling, the, be- the more your sampling is scattered, the better representation you will have. But we can always do better and better and have higher number of of, uh, of sample. But the, then the the cons are will be that you need more fund and you need more time and t- till you reach a level where you have a good representation. So here we have a very fair representation according to to, to what uh, we've seen uh, to get a first idea about what is going on here. So after the analysis, we use that marker. I'll show you the data. But basically, to jump straight to the to the results is that. Here you have a percentage. This percentage is be, is percentage of belonging to the lineage C. So the lineage C is basically the lineage I just uh, talked about. It's located in this in the central and south east of of Europe. Uh, you see that you see a lot of blue. 90, 100, 100, 100, uh, 93 person, ninety four approximately person of the sample they belong to that lineage. Um, if we move on to the lineage M, the lineage M is the West Mediterranean lineage. The lineage C is the North Mediterranean lineage. The lineage M basically comprises only two subspecies, Apis mellifera mellifera, the French um, honeybee. Uh, French, they like it when you tell the French. and uh, But uh, European, they say, oh, no, it's not French, it's European. And then they start fighting. Or then they call they call it the black honeybee. So the mellifera mellifera basically let's say that to avoid a conflict between uh, our people in Europe. So uh, and uh, Iberiensis Iberiensis the uh, repartition area of it is North Spain and Portugal. Um, so we see we have a small percentage like three point two percent, which is good in fact. It's it's good. It's low, but it's good. We'll talk about this a little bit later and then we can see it per state some state they definitely have no m lineage uh, you can see here and some others they have so we try to understand the pattern but the problem is that we have so much transhumance in the u.s and mainly the the samples are coming from uh, 
mainly stationary beekeepers, I would say in 2019, this sampling was, uh, was conducted. Uh, 2019, yes. Uh, so this is the results of the lineage M. And then we move to the lineage A, which is the African lineage, a very interesting lineage, in fact, the African lineage. By the way, just to here mention before I forget, um, the, the most diversified lineage is the African lineage. It's, it's an amazing diversity. It's a continent. It's a huge continent there. You've got uh, uh, many subspecies with different characteristics and local adaptation to different climates and environment there. But basically, lineage A, uh, we had also a 3%. So the bottom line is, is that we have a 94% C lineage. And if you want, 6% other lineages, A and M. Now, if we dig a little bit deeper within the C lineage, now we want to go, go a little bit higher. We want to determine the subspecies uh, using the, using the uh, identification of the haplotypes. So haplotype C2 characterizes the craniolin bees or Apis mellifera carnica. And Apis mellifera carnica is the most used subspecies in the USA according to our study, and based on the might of our sampling. Uh, 90, uh, 49% of the sample, they were identified as haplotype C2. And C2 characterized the carniolindis, or Apis mellifera carnica. And you see the percentage now, they are dropping because we are moving up, you know, a little bit to more specific uh, identification. Uh, the second subspecies, that is that had a high uh, percentage, 38.7, let's say 39% is the Italian um, bees. Italian bees are everywhere. Uh, and it's characterized by the C1 haplotype, basically. Uh, we see that it's running almost everywhere um, beside the um, carniolin bees. Now, uh, the Bookfast line, the Bookfast line um, that was created by Brother uh, Adams, I guess, is uh, characterized by the C3 haplotype. So in, in, in the U.S., we have Bookfast bees. It has been used 3.9%. This percentage is within a subspecies, uh, the total subspecies amount, not the lineage. Uh, we should distinguish that. Uh, so beekeepers of the U.S., they kind of like the C3, the Bookfast, they have it running around, uh, not everywhere, but you see the buckets um, of it here and there. And then, in fact, after screening all those haplotypes and blasting their sequence with the database on NCBI and other databases, compiling all the sequence we have worldwide, in fact, some of them did not correspond to any already identified haplotype, which is very interesting. In that case, we call those novel haplotypes. And in the US, after a thorough evaluation of and vetting of our haplotypes, we, we match them. Uh, well, we have some haplotypes that has never been identified in the old world, as well as in the new world. And those are called novel haplotypes. So how they've been created, we can discuss that a little bit later, but basically they are not 100% identical to what was already described in the literature. And we see that we have identified in the US 14 different haplotype, novel haplotype. They are specific to the US because we couldn't identify them. Uh, we couldn't identify them elsewhere and they are not in any database. So we claim that those are novel haplotypes. Uh, we give them names and um, you can see, see that in the paper, uh, but they are running some of them are like the same, you know, they are, they've been uh, shared between states. Uh, and uh, the percentage of novel haplotype, haplotypes were 4.8% uh, of the total amount of um, the sample. Now, we're talking about that, the name of those haplotypes, but how this is translated in terms of um, phenotype. And I like to show this, this is from my, uh, apiary in the lab because my my colonies are typed and it's really just to show 
myself first and 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 uh, um, beekeepers how this is presented. So when you look, we need, we need to be careful because coloring and the tomentum, pilosity, all those aspects of cubical index and uh, done by Rittner, you need to take those 45 characteristics and count all of them together to be able to conclude with a certain level of probability that this colony is Italian or this queen is Italian. Here also you see the same. Uh, this is C1. This is a, a colony that was typed C1. Uh, I just put this percentage of the U.S., but you can ignore that. But that, that's a C1 haplotype because I typed that colony. And it's just to really see uh, what we can see in, in terms of color. See, the queen is really ye yellow in that case. But that's that's not like conclusive. We need to be careful. Uh, and then the bees are kind of yellowy, and you see like this yellow color. Uh, this The C2 haplotype, and we will go to the, if you want, sub-haplotype, this is a cran craniole and origin colony, basically, because it was typed C2J. Uh, I have some queen here. You see the difference in, in color, the queen, as well as the bees. And you see this mixing that we have in the U.S. Usually, when I was at least working in, in, in Syria and in Europe, you don't see that like, classification of super sister. You have like a very different, different color in the, in the bees. But it is definitively darker than the previous one. Uh, this colony. And then I have in my location uh, four hives and they are African haplotypes. This is an, a colony with an, carrying an African haplotype. So the mother is from African origin. Now the paternal heredity is completely different topic. You know, how much this, colon, this queen was um, uh, introgressed with local drone, that's a, you need a different type of marker. But the lineage of the mother originally is uh, from Africa. And you, you, can, you can see that it's darker. Even the size of bees, when I look at them, they are like really feather, a little smaller than uh, This is the uh, A4P haplotype. And it was identified in the US 0 0.94, almost 1% um, of the sample carried that specific haplotype. Okay, this is in terms of phenotype. Now, just to summarize really quickly the, um, the finding in this table, we can see that overall, this, what we found overall, those 13 haplotypes, they've been identified in, in the old world. Uh, they have all their profile, they have their length, they have their names, see? And mainly they've been identified by uh, uh, um, Lionel Garnery, in the CNRS and other people also identified the same in other countries uh, outside of France. And they have the reference and they blast it completely. And uh, you can see the percentage. So 95% of our samples, they've been identified and they are identical to what we have in Europe. Now the novel one, I did like a separate, uh, uh, separate table for them or, or bottom table, I put them. Those are 14 haplotypes that was never identified anywhere. You can see you've got some mutations. You've got 90, they blasted, but 99.6. And so they have, they, they have some differences in their polymorphism. And we give them new names and they represent 4.8% of our samples. Those are novel haplotypes. How many they are? We have 14 novel US haplotypes that our study was able to um, identify. Now, if we want to confirm the overall validity of our sequence and our work, where well, we do basically what we call um, dendrogram or genetic tree. And you can, you can see here really roughly that we have two major haplotype crushing everything in the US, the C141.5% and then the C2J 40.1. And then you've got some, those are completely identical, if you want, sequence. Then you have some differences at the, at the, at the end of the branch where you see those, some variety of haplotypes within the, West, within the North Mediterranean lineage. And to confirm this, we did an, uh, the same thing with the sequence that we obtained from the coding gene. And you see also the same structure. Eventually, you will have some differences because this is 
the rate of evolution of uh, coding gene is, is completely different than a non-coding area. Uh, nonetheless, you still see this major two haplotype, which is the C1 and C2 J in the sample of the US. Now to go a little bit further to confirm that we rely on what haplotypes in the US, well, we conducted a network of haplotypes and also to see what was present before, what is the ancestor, ancestor ancestral haplotype. Uh, we see here the same finding is that the major population are expressed by the C2J and C1. And then you've got basically some uh, uh, C1, uh, C2, uh, C2I, C2D, those are haplotypes from Europe, but they are really in minority. And then this little vertical um, dash is really the number of mutation from where they've originated for this is like a mathematical calculation and estimation. And then the central haplotype would be really the, if you want the ancestral haplotype from where the other haplotype uh, diverged with the number of mutation. And if you look here at the edge, you see those are novel haplotypes. In fact, they are completely separated from the crowd and they are by themselves and they display some mutation. You see them and they, they are here too. Uh, so those are very interesting haplotype, haplotypes to focus on uh, because they've evolved lately, in fact, according to the um, uh, haplotype network. Uh, now, this was for the C lineage. If we move to the uh, M lineage, although, you know, we have just 3.2% M lineage, Nonetheless, you know, I did I did this network to see do we rely on on what is the major haplotype that that we we have in the U.S. and you can see that in terms of the West Mediterranean lineage, we rely on the novel haplotype. They have the lion share. See, those are novel haplotype with the USA at the end, and then the classic uh, European haplotypes like M3 and M4. Those are classic. They are in minority here. It's like the other way around, if you want. So beekeepers are like circulating more the haplotype that were born in the U.S. or that mutated in the U.S. or adjusted to the U.S. environment or something like that, more than the classic haplotypes that were that were identified in the U.S. Um, the 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 African lineage. This is the network for the African lineage. It's also three person. Uh, this is just to have an idea, really. Uh, the major classic haplotypes of Africa, the A1, A4, P, E, uh, they are in circulation, basically, uh, within this 3% um, in our B population in the U.S. Uh, the thing that here I want to mention is that the... the Haplotypes of Africa, um, some of the, they, we don't really have a characterization. We can't link a haplotype to a specific subspecies, which is really challenging and annoying. Um, but that is the case you, for, for some reason, is that uh, I can't tell if the haplotype A1 is, for example, for unicolor or scutellata, because it was identified in both subspecies. So we need more study. We have very few studies coming out of Africa, the whole continent, in fact. Uh, this is why we can't attribute a specific haplotype to a specific subspecies. Uh, this is why we call them African haplotypes in general. Uh, lately, I, I, I was collaborating with the uh, um, University of uh, Anaba in, in Algeria, and on Intermisa, we found a lot of A1, uh, but A1 also was described on Scutellata, so this is the challenge. So there is no specificity in terms of haplotype for the African lineage. Now, finally, to conclude, in fact, is we, we have this diversity in the, in the old world, uh, as described before. We've imported here, but the current status that we have here, if we summarize everything, we have a haplotype diversity in the US that is 0 0.597. So it is like almost half 50 percent and then we heavily rely on two single haplotypes as we've seen from the data and those are the c1 the c2j and the diversity we have in the old world is all what we have because i mean diversity won't come from the sky basically uh, the genetic pool bees evolved in the old world we don't have any reports of of native bees from the u.s native honeybees from the u.s 
what we have here is what we've imported throughout the existence or well, 400 years for, um, uh, since um, uh, the um, 1600. Um, so basically here, the estimation that we have, and according to what I've seen, what I've showed you that on this subspecies here in Syriaca, we had, we had identified 27 different haplotypes. Um, other scientists, they've shown here in Karnica that they've identified in the, in the native land of Karnica, they've identified 13 different haplotypes, C1, C2i, C2j, C2d, etc. In the French subspecies, as we've seen, we counted and identified, now there are more, but that was study of 2011 that, uh, of uh, um, We really uh, identified 90, 91, 92 different haplotypes, and so on, and especially in Africa we have. A, so if we estimate that the whole United States is 76% of our bees are characterized by two single haplotypes with um, a haplotype diversity that is 0.5% uh, only. Um, rough estimation is that what we have here in the US would represent mainly the gen our genetic pool basically would be would be 5% the best estimation of the major pool of the native land of the the, the whole um, other subspecies of um, Mellifera that we have in the old world. So this is a rough conclusion at the end uh, of this study. And uh, well, thank you very much for listening and let's um, take your question or your comments or let's have a discussion on that topic. Yes, thank you, uh, Mohammed. That's very, very interesting. When I saw the paper, I was intrigued. When I saw 94%, I was, I, I have to say that I, I thought something was wrong. <laughs> something was wrong with the data. I was like, oh, Mohammed, you messed up. But no, I, I, apparently that's it. Oh, man. So what, what exactly does that mean? Um, I mean, um, we went back to see, to see the wave of importation that we had. It was, it was cited also in the introduction of, of the paper. Um, basically, People throughout the time, they were bringing waves of, of bees. Um, even one study um, 10 years ago, I think I, I, I read one study in which uh, they were able to identify Syriaca in Texas, just to give you an idea. Uh, I saw the paper and I, I said to myself, this is very interesting because even normal people, what they were saying, you know, oh, the the weather of Texas, you know, it's like kind of similar to Syria and maybe that subspecies there with the immigration, with the waves of, of immigrants too, they were bringing some from their mainland basically by, by like visual estimation. Oh, okay, you know, this, our subspecies, the climate is the same. Maybe, maybe it can um, survive in this uh, area. And, um, and, and identifying Syriaca in Texas was very interesting with that paper. Uh, I don't remember the author. Uh, but they had this this Z haplotype. Uh, they mistakenly named the haplotype O, which we corrected that previously in our work. But it was the it was the polymorphism and the pattern of the Syriaca. So Syriaca was identified in Texas. Uh, but we we the thing is we couldn't really know how much we've imported. Now this study is telling us that uh, during the waves that we had and the uh, uh, immigrants coming uh, throughout the years, uh, bees were imported to, to the country. And now we want to know how much we've imported and what type of diversity we have. And now we have, we have a pretty fair answer of the diversity we have if we compare that with the old world and what they have there, because bees evolved for millions of years in, in the territory of Africa and the old world. And that's, that's the point to, to really understand. Uh, that this evolution lasted for a long time and has given birth to this beautiful diversity, adaptation, haplotype, ecotypes. Um, and now, now it's changing, especially in Europe. I mean, in Africa, not too much. But in Europe, they are making some replacement to the native uh, subspecies they have there. Regarding 
for the practical beekeeper, the guy that I try to help <clears throat> every every week or so in the field when I got the call and people ask for guidance, what is best, what it's not. What do you what do you think about that as for the for the beekeepers in the United States? Do you see this as a an advantage that people basic based on the American way of beekeeping and they they end up with this and these are a good bees for the environment and the systems that we have here or this could be a disadvantage and maybe even explain the things that sometimes happen when you have little problems they become bigger because there is no much diversity to basically fix the problem itself uh, I, I would like to know your thoughts on that and then I will give you mine okay so it is it is a common knowledge that in any um, population you don't want to reach a genetic bottleneck or an inbreeding situation where you have a lack of diversity why simply and everybody knows that because simply you will have less ability to deal with the stressor whether they are biotic stressor or abiotic stressors so if you have a diverse uh, genome, uh, more it is diverse, more probability, you will have more probability to have different traits to deal with the stressors. Um, you don't want to end up with a shrinking diversity and then a bottleneck and then a inbreeding things because one single disease will come or a new parasite or whatever and it will annihilate the entire population. So uh, we need diversity uh, and uh, we need bees for pollination and we need bees for our business. We need, uh, we want beekeepers to have uh, excellent bees, less control, less spending money on controlling barwa mite, et cetera, et cetera. And to do so, some strategies, some strategy uh, would be, uh, so, some people would look at it uh, as I see it personally, is the best uh, um, avenue is really to enhance the overall genetic diversity of the population. Uh, some other people, they might decide to, okay, we're going to conduct like breeding programs to target specific traits. That's okay too. Uh, but as a nation, uh, we should be aware that we need a diverse population in, in our um, in our um, uh, honeybees honeybee hives and colony what does it mean for the normal beekeepers like you and me and uh, your audience it means that this could explain in a way or in another why we are facing all these problems of like requeening or queen procedure or a lack of resistance to disease so Everything boils down to the genetic background. You know, uh, if you have a strong genetic, you will be able to deal more with the stressors. Uh, so, no, it is not good. If we have a if if we have a shrinking diversity in the U.S., that's bad eventually. Uh, so, we need to boost that diversity to be to hit a threshold or a level of acceptance where it is acceptable at that level, and also. I don't claim that the genetic diversity is everything. You've got also other things that are playing because the problem we're facing is really multifactorial problems. You've got like climate issue, you've got like lack of forage, you've got the urbanization, you've got the, so many, many, many topics. Uh, but basically we will be better off if we have a strong diversity in the honeybee population um, of, of our country. This is this is something that I, I I spend a good amount of time thinking uh, to 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 try to first to convince myself before I start to talk with other beekeepers. But when you when you have a situation with the kind of beekeeping that we do here, with all these pollination services, where the bees are moving all over, there is not a specific place where they really stop to stay and adapt for their specific environment, climate, uh, water quality, whatever we, they're gonna face in a specific place. They're, most of the bees here in the United States, they're constantly moving. So do you think in that case, we need to select something for that kind of specific 
situation to keep the system running or we need perhaps try to start conversations with beekeepers to to try because i don't i don't have the numbers like i i know in brazil um big beekeepers it's not even close what the big beekeepers here are but the way i feel and i would love to have a study on that if the people let it go a little bit, if the costs, of course, it's going to have some costs at the beginning until you have some adaptation. But if that's not going to be worth it to actually to the, to, to the welfare of the beekeepers too, because the beekeepers are suffering to keep a system the way <clears> I see it and spending some money that I don't know if it's worth it unless to, for their own health. I saw a lot of beekeepers killing themselves, basically killing themselves to keep the bees alive and safe and spending money and time. And some of those, I, I look, they look older than they're supposed to be. And I, I, I always have this in my mind. What is the best thing? Keep the way it is or let it go? And of course, it's going to have some, you know, loss and things. But with a little bit of time and people together, we reach a situation that we don't need to to do too much management management anymore and go back to the old times that you know we just like like my my old folks like to say we just keep the bees in the woods and we go fish and hunting and we go back three months later and we get the benefits of the hives so that's the way they did it before and now it's the constant work i don't know what's work what is the best thing to do keep the system the way it is or do something else to minimize those problems that you know when you're in the system you don't see it you just keep doing it but you, you you can't calculate the other problems that you have with your own health the health of your family or lack of vacation or other other not beekeeping rela related problems to your life thoughts mm. on that <laughs> yeah so i mean our our way of beekeeping if you compare it with with other nations it is different because we have our own way of of beekeeping. Uh, now, we, we really need, I mean, it's, we need to sustain the economy in a way or in another. There is yeah. no way around it. We want our queen producers to thrive, do business, uh, make money. We want the agricultural system, uh, farmers to also have their, their crops pollinated, improve the quality of their fruits, the production. Uh, we can't just cut ourselves and say, okay, we are going to go to the old way. It's not possible. And it's a free market here but i think we can introduce some changes because uh, many studies ha ha have indicated that uh, when you transom bees across the, uh, the the states to go to for pollination in california and come back and winter in florida etc uh, you are stressing them you know uh, they are stressed they've got a lot of uh, uh, gene of stress they were highly expressed on the, and then they collapse because you know you can't overwork them, basically. Uh, and beekeepers, they know that, but it's a matter of profit, profitability. So if, if it is profitable for me and to make 300, 400 bucks or more per hive, I will do it and then, uh, and then you know, that's it. I will requeen or I'll produce some honey and then I will, I will just split again. And so uh, I think we need a global nationwide strategy that is... Um, um, that that will deal with all those issues. It's it's not easy, and and I, I am personally against like going and changing a system that is running so far. But we can introduce some small changes and educate ourselves and and the beekeepers and nationwide and the queen producers and the breeders that guys we have this issue and your business is running now, but it's troubling because we need to make some changes to improve uh, your business to be more sustainable. Because if we continue doing what we are doing and we are not alerted by, with what we, uh, by what we are seeing and we just do the business as we've been doing it, uh, then it, it will reach a level where it's going to collapse. There's, there's no way around it. So um, what we need is a sustainable global strategy uh, to start changing and changing small things that will better the bees. And, you know, now we know that this transhumance is causing spread of disease everywhere and it's causing like degradation in the queen quality and performance. 
and w uh, pesticide residues and even bees are killed wh while while pollinating due to uh, spraying of, of chemicals and etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, if we leave it to the open market what will happen is that it won't be profitable anymore and then the beekeeper will have to decide okay you know what i'm not going to take my bees to pollination or whatever i don't want this 200 300 bucks i'll change my mind and keep make honey in where i am or move within my state so it will change but i would prefer not to have like the the event coming and imposing on us the decision that we need to take but be proactive and really uh, take ourselves uh precocious measurements to improve our beekeeping in general in, in the country yeah it, it, i, I want to pick your brain about those new haplotypes the u.s haplotypes i would like to know your thoughts on that do you think this is a selection exactly for this situation we're talking about we have more be selected to be more resistant to stress for example for those trips or w w what do you think is this selection pressure to because when you look at the map where where are those locations where the most of those neo haplotypes were found there is anything specific, yeah. special about those yeah this is a very interesting question in fact because i looked at it from that perspective in fact uh, i couldn't find a link uh, but there are couple haplotypes I, i mean since they are in really minority they represent i think was was it uh, three percent of the whole um no a little bit more in fact uh but uh, regardless of that uh we we don't know in fact what we don't know we need to identify them we need to because we receive dead samples uh we can't track them to a colony yeah. uh, uh alive you know uh and this is what, one aspect that that is that would be very interesting we don't know if they have they have mutated definitively uh they have changed over 100 years I mean, 100 years also, you have to keep in mind that it's nothing if you compare that to the standard original haplotype or the classic haplotype that was uh, that were um, uh, that was that were evolving in, in the native land of the subspecies. But nonetheless, they are different. So a mutation happened. We don't know if this mutation is has a meaning, evolutionary meaning or or not. This is to be studied, in fact. Uh, because the notion of haplotype is different than the notion of ecotype you know um so we need to really separate these two things uh but this is to to be determined and localized those haplotype and then study the the, the performance of those colony and what would differ between this haplotype and another haplotype currently in, in my lab we are doing a study to determine the Uh, it's an etho uh, ethoecological study to determine what is the difference in terms of behavior between a C2J and C2I or an African what they how how the queen are behaving what what is the main difference under the similar climate where they are in the same apiary how they differ you know um, in how they manage the colony how they manage the honey uh, storage when they kick off uh, laying eggs when the queen will stop all those things they need to be applied to those novel haplotypes in fact so we don't so i don't know in fact and that's a very critical and crucial question fact right, that we need to pursue hopefully the other the other thing that i always think when i see those new variants the, the new haplotypes if there is any study or even comparing the those haplotypes that we know regarding resistant to different diseases there is any lab studies or virus infection injections on those bees and see how who replicate more or less or who is more resistant or less so um yeah that's that's very interesting too but i just want to mention something that i i just um, remembered one of the novel haplotype was circulating everywhere like in many states in fact it was like the most common one was everywhere which will lead you to understand that this haplotype was carried by queen producers somewhere and now we we are working with our uh, brilliant queen producers across the nation who are doing the same study but within their operations and uh, uh through the university of, of maryland too we've um, uh, agreed on on conducting the same study to help them out with with their business and work you know and to see if because the this study was conducted on sample from beekeepers now we want 
those big queen producers, 13 or 14 that we have uh, in the U.S., we want to see if their stock has the same diversity or maybe better than what beekeepers, normal beekeepers uh, have in the U.S. But one of the interesting haplotypes that I tracked down, the new one, it was like circulating in seven, eight states. Some others, they are state um, specific. So those, the ones circulating, most probably they were with the, within the operation of some uh, queen producers. And usually queen producers, when they don't like a colon, they're not going to breed from it, you know. So maybe they have very nice characteristics, whether broad production or resistance to varroa or, um, but we need a study with that. Um, now we have some studies, not in terms of haplotypes, but in terms of Italian bees versus Russian bees, Italian bees versus Carniolan bees. So these major, uh, major bees, subspecies, we have some extensive study on their performance. Like we know, for example, the Italian bees, which is the C1 in our case, they, they start like crazy laying eggs at the beginning of the season and they winter on huge population. And in fact, what happened in my apiary last week, last two week, two weeks ago, one entire population of um, um, C1 haplotype perished. You know why? Because very early in the, in the springtime, uh, the queen start, started laying eggs like crazy and I had brood everywhere and rain came outside. They exhausted this, the uh, storage of uh, honey and the queen was continuously, and I was observing, and the queen was continuously laying eggs, laying eggs. And then they collapsed because the, the flora was not, was not uh, sustaining them but they couldn't find like a, they couldn't find a signal or something that oh we need to stop laying eggs because we need to feed those new baby bees you know <laughs> somewhere or another mm -hmm. and feed ourselves the foragers so the queen was thinking that yeah okay it's the springtime and then in Maryland sometimes we have like bumps where where you don't have flower anymore for a couple of weeks or you have like rain coming and then the two two colonies in fact with the, the same symptom they collapsed they died inside of the colony with with maybe five, six uh, cat uh, broad uh, frames, like entirely. It was like very wow. sad to see. But this is an indication uh, of lack of adaptation uh, where there is, I don't know, I don't know exactly uh, how we need to understand this uh, um, uh, phenomenon, uh, but I've seen some very well adapted haplotypes in the French, uh, 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 in Melifera, Melifera, in France, where where they can slow down when they have like a signal that, you know what, it, it is just rain outside for a long time or the, there's no more flower. or So th there is a balance with nature and you want to, you, you, you want to find this balance between how, how, where to go and how quick we need to go in terms of queen laying eggs and the, the bee to, uh, the colony to, um, to, to, to expand. And this is, this is very crucial, in fact. So those haplotypes, they might be, we have studies on on subspecies and performance of subspecies and some behavioral study on the biological development of the colony. But here we're talking about more specific things. If you want to compare, Carnica has many haplotypes, 13, 14 haplotypes. Uh, we don't know the difference between those C2i, C2j, how they, they differ. They are both characterized as Carnica. But it's like if you want a sub subspecies, you know. So we, we need we need to study um, this aspect. Yeah. Yeah, that's quite interesting. Uh, the main examples of success that I see in the field, and I, again, I don't have hard numbers on that. It's just observation in the field. Myself talking and visiting many people is the beekeepers are more successful here in the United States, and we need to define success. Success to me is have a sustainable business model that keep them healthy too. It's not only about profit. So my, my definition of success is to have a, a, a beekeeping operation that you have control over, more control over so you can feel, you can control your life better too. The, the beekeepers that I see that way are two main characteristics, local selection and avoid uh, California pollination. These, these are the people that I see even retiring early in their 40s, very successful. They're able, I 
I made enough money with my bees. I can retire now. They sell the operation and things like that. I saw a couple of examples and that was the pattern that I saw. Local, be, local selection and avoid California. That, that's, it, it, yeah, a lot of things outside uh, happening in, in the world, Mohammed. Mohammed, let's take some questions. Let's see what the people are saying here. Guys, if you're listening, it, now is the time to write some questions. So let me see if we can get some questions here so we can continue this discussion. All right. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Oh. People from everywhere in the world. Guys, thank you very much for coming in. It's very nice. Wow, you are, you are, your, your show is so famous, uh, Humbert, to see. Um, I, am I? I don't think so. But I'm a small YouTuber trying to do my <laughs> uh, Let me put this on. Oh, here we go. How is it possible to measure bug fast lineage since there really is no such thing? So we need to define that. Bug fast hasn't been evolving for 50 million years. What do you get from this question? Yeah, that's, a, that's a very interesting uh, comment. Yeah. In fact, uh, the bug fast lineage, what happened is how it has been characterized with the C3 haplotype is that uh, the lab where I did my PhD, in fact, uh, the... Um, Previous people working, they were in touch with the um, uh, brother Adams in UK, I think. And what what when they were breeding the Bukfast, they took uh, from them uh, the the um, a bunch of of bees that they considered their the hybrid, and they typed them using that test. And in all those uh, samples that they received, they've seen a single mutation on the population produced by Brother Adams, uh, which he considered to be the Bukfast. Um, and that single mutation uh, is very, it's a really single mutation. You see it in the polymorphism. Uh, it changed the, the pattern. And then uh, with further uh, analysis in the future from other populations sold by those people uh, elsewhere, they also uh, saw the same um, the same pattern, and the lab identified and linked characterized the Bukfast with the C three uh, haplotype uh, with a very distinct uh, distinct um, uh, pattern, and it was also confirmed with with other studies. So where, uh, um, whenever you see uh, whenever you see a C three haplotype, this one is most of the time uh, originally from a book fast line. Now, another quick answer too, um, to the other part of the question, book fast hasn't been evolved for um, 50 million years. Uh, those new haplotypes we have in the US, uh, they haven't evolved uh, 50 million years. They've evolved uh, 400 years, maybe less. So uh, we don't know when a mutation will happen and change the, the, the polymorphism of this specific marker. But this marker is very flexible, in fact, and it, it can it can trace the evolution maybe on hundred years or or less or more. Uh, I don't know exactly, but uh, but the novel haplotypes in the U.S. is a very good um, analogy between the uh, Bukfast having a specific polymorphism with that marker uh, and the novel haplotype identified in the U.S. Interesting. Yeah, I, I don't know much about that. So I was curious to see your response for that. Okay, let's continue here. No schools a lot in California. Did you see any? So California, um, let me see. I can go back to quickly to the map and see. Um, it, it, the thing I explained is I'm looking just at the lineage. Um, So I, I don't have the slide, unfortunately. Um, I don't remember, in fact, I need to go back to the, to the uh, original, uh, on the original paper, but um, yeah, I don't have them here per state though. Uh, 
from memory, I don't think we have any African lineage. We don't know if it is Cutellata or not, by the way. We can't yeah, determine that. Yeah, that's, a, that's a good point. It's just African lineage. Uh, so we, from memory, because we had, we, had a high, we had a higher number of samples from California. California, we had like 30-something. If I go back to the map, uh, sorry, that one. Yeah, we had 37 uh, samples from California. Uh, but I don't. I don't really remember um, if we had some African lineage in California. All right. Brian is asking any advantage using Russian bees. We have experience uh, with Russian bees. Yeah, I have purchased uh, ten, twenty queens a couple years ago from a breeder, and Russian bees. Basically, they are Epismellifera caucasica mainly. They are very good to deal with the varroa mite. Uh, they have a high hygienic behavior. I mean, I would say it depends, but in general, in general term. Yeah. Uh, and they are doing well, in fact. They've been uh, doing well for the last two years. Uh, now, uh, there is some... So, so... It's it's good to ha to make to to have Caucasica and it's if they are more if they if they are more resistant they have a high a higher hygienic behavior to deal with varomite and you feel that they are um, well adapted to where you are because in the U.S. we have a very different climates from one state to another so it's also the it's also for beekeepers to determine because the climate you have in Arizona or in California is completely different than Maryland or, or the Southern States or here or there. And I think we need to find like, we need to work together to really start finding local adaptation to those haplotypes. If, if there is any, we need to check and then maybe distribute them, maybe not on the commercial beekeepers or, 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 or beekeepers, just the stationary beekeepers and do some study on uh, a haplotype would do better in, in the southern state where or in florida where it's too humid or in the desert area in arizona in california or or in the north so this is this is something to determine but but eventually uh russian bees if if they are really russian bees caucasica i dealt with caucasica in the middle east it's a very good subspecies uh and uh, uh it is the origin of the vsh uh subspecies produced by the USDA uh, uh, lab in Baton Rouge. Uh, and um, it was part of the breeding program that they had at that time. So, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of Caucasica, in fact. All right. Thank you, Brian. Do different haplotypes survive better in cold climates, specifically growing zone five, similar to Lavo, Quebec, where there are sub-zero winter temperatures and months of snow. Well, great. That's in fact this is exactly what I was just speaking about. Yeah. Um, so the the thing that we it's complex, but I would simplify it to say this is something really the next step that we need to do, and we are planning to do that. But we need help. We need help of. Everybody, the queen producer in U.S., Canada, we need help from people overseas um, to be able to. And we have collaboration projects going on with with France and with with the Greece, and uh, we're we're trying. But you know, this is a global effort that needs to be um, um, uh, undertaken. Uh, so the point is, I'll give you a very very straightforward example. If you look at the subspecies Mellifera mellifera. If no, in the northern part of France, uh, I remember seeing uh, the black honeybee surviving very well in the forest area in the conservation center that my uh, uh, PhD supervisor uh, established there, and I was helping him in that effort. They were surviving extremely well, and in condition where you've got snow for a long time, the weather is completely different, and. If you bring an Italian bee from the Mediterranean Sea, close to the Mediterranean Sea, maybe perhaps never seen uh, uh, snow, and you put them over there, 
they might survive, but is it sustainable or not? Or they will face like maybe Nozimo's problem or they will, they, it, it, even us as human being, when you move from one country that is like tropical to another country that is uh, very cold, like uh, north part of Canada, Quebec City, for example, uh, you need some time to adjust and then do, are they, they are not going to evolve in a couple of years. They will die. They will simply die. So evolution is not on like, uh, the, the life cycle of bees is not that rapid like bacteria or other to really evolve and pr produce uh, some adaptation. So adaptation will take time. So we need to determine this and we need to know, we need to see those M haplotypes that we have in the US, for example. Those M haplotypes, they can either be Epismellifera mellifera or they can be Epismellifera ibriensis. There is no way around it. You just have these two subspecies. And those maybe they've been there because the beekeepers judged that, oh, you know what? This colony is very good. It's doing very well in the cold. It's, but nothing is written, you know, nothing is, is proven scientifically. So we need to address that question. Um, and, and that is the challenge. And hopefully we'll, we'll be able to work on, on that soon where we can determine that, you know, this type of haplotypes or this type of lineage, at least, forget about haplotypes, even lineage, uh, this lineage would do better in the northern part of the U.S. Uh, African haplotypes will do better in Arizona and California and Texas, for example, and so on and so forth. Uh, that is how I see it from, from an ecological perspective. Fair enough. Mohamed, do you know anything about the Canadians' uh, situation regarding diversity? There is any study that you know so I, I did some preliminary data when I was in uh, Canada doing my postdoc. Uh, and I remember uh, it was on a small, uh, small um, sampling uh, size, in fact. Um, I remember that I was able to identify couple M haplotypes, which is Ibariensis and Mellifera. And then the rest was mainly Italian. Uh, I think the the sampling was 25 coming from mainly Quebec City area. Uh, but uh, in terms of uh, using that specific marker that we've used, I haven't seen a similar study to really, and, and Canada is, is different than the US, you know. So beekeeping activity is really located in the big areas. The rest is, I don't know what they have in, in the other um, um, geography, big, huge geography of, of, the, of Canada. But, but then you can study the history. You can see the wave of importation, what people were bringing. And then maybe Canadian can do similar study in Canada. But I would say, and they're importing a lot of queens from the U.S. So I would say they would have something similar, you know, to what we have in the U.S. Um, that's, that's just like, like my um, guess, you know, if you want. Yeah, we, well, I'm going to touch a, a very controversial topic here, but uh, you know beekeepers. They, they're they transferring <laughs> things all the time uh, without any permission, and we never know what we have. Uh, well, which is exactly what Laura is asking here in a different way. Are there any plans for research studies to introduce new phenohalotypes in the U.S.? Do you know any on that direction, Mohammed. So, introduction uh, is very complicated subject, right? Yeah. So uh, I know that um, university Dr. Uh, Steve um, Shepard has been importing um, um, drone semen from from Europe, from different, uh, and doing a, a cryo cryopreservation program running at the University of Washington State. I know that. I know couple labs. Uh, of the federal government, they have a specific uh, authorization for research purpose to import, for testing, to import uh, bees over, from overseas. Uh, um, but uh, the, so those are very minor, um, very minor importations just for scientific purpose, I would say. Uh, the other thing is what we can do here in the U.S. is, in fact, start already with the new things we have and see, locate them and see where they are. And then I intensify, try to intensify this diversity with the effort of our queen producers and beekeepers, especially commercial beekeepers, 
intensify this diversity in a similar location to enhance the genetic diversity within the DCA. So if we do that, uh, we have a potential of creating a global enhancement of uh, the diversity within a couple of apiaries. And from there, we can, we can start. But now the problem is that our diversity is so diluted, if you want. It's diluted over the map. Uh, this is also an issue that, that we are facing. You know, which, which brings the, I think you already touched base on that, with, the, with this question. So how people can help with the diversity? Uh, so within our setup, our way of beekeeping in the U.S., uh, what we need, in fact, in, in my opinion, we need to work closely with our uh, queen producers first. We need to see their stock and try to help them uh, to enhance their diversity with scientific data, you know, to see what they have first. And then since they are mainly um providing the queens to a lot of, of uh, beekeepers across the nation. And then do, as Humberto said, you know, I do my own uh, selection in my uh, apiary. And we all do that, in fact, in a way or in another. Oh, this colony is good. I'm going to keep it. I'm going to raise queen from that one and this one. And this one is producing more honey. This one is not, is has a high, uh, low or high load of, of aromite. So all beekeepers, they do their own selection in a way. So continue doing that because this is very good. Um, but, but at the end of the day, uh, we need to, we need to see with the queen producers where we can help introducing some changes in, as I explained, condensing this diversity and spreading those rare haplotypes. The rare haplotype are very interesting, but, but locating them would be a nightmare. <laughs> That's the thing because... It's now if you go back to we know the names of I don't know them personally, but University of Maryland, they know the names of those beekeepers. They can go back, but they go back. Oh, OK, this colony died, for example, from 2019 or whatever. So we need like a ongoing um, ongoing programs of, of, of selection and diffusion of those uh, haplotypes. And then condensing the diversity we have in the U.S. and uh, having more local diversity to improve the DCA's di within the, the DCA's diversity to improve it, increase it, and and then test what what we are getting, as well as trying to find um, specific haplotypes for specific conditions or for macro environmental uh, uh, adaptation, something like this. That would, would help um, greatly. Fair enough. Mohammed, what do you think of the, the importation of the Russian bees have any impact on that in your, in your data, in the population here? So I can stream. Um, what's covered by what impact on diversity of the bees? So I don't. Um, so I am. Um, I don't know about USDA Russian importation. I I know that the USDA has produced through a breeding program the VSH line. Um, so um, we need to we need to put thing, things into perspective. Yeah, you know, no matter what you import, if you import uh, hundred queens, two hundred queens, a thousand queens, over the time, in a huge nation. Uh, th this will not have an impact, you know. Uh, so um, you need a massive, massive invasion of something to make a change in a population, you know. So, uh, so I don't, I don't really know the scope of of the importation that was done, but the importation done by the USDA uh, in its Baton Rouge lab it was controlled uh, importation for scientific. A scientifically uh, vetted program and they produced the VSH line which was uh, acknowledged by many beekeepers to be uh, more resistant to more resistant to varwamide than other classic uh, lines or subspecies we have in the market that's my understanding which come with this next question here how do hybrid lines like VSH and the pole line fit into the conversation about genetic diversity. 
Yeah, so uh, those those names that we have, uh, they are they are lines. That's why we call them lines. They've been uh, selected with breeding programs, and they've been selected for a very specific trait. So, uh, via search for hygienic behavior, gathering those two genes that will allow bees to sense the presence of varroa or the smell of of the of the pupae, and then uncap the second gene would would help to uncap this and get. Uh, so those are very targeted, uh, like surgical breeding program, if you want, for specific traits. Here, what we are talking about, uh, and I'm, I'm in favor of, of this school, is an enhancement of the overall diversity. So, uh, so, so those are surgical lines for spec- to address specific issues, uh, while uh, the topic that I've been uh, speaking about is really an overview of the uh, evolution and diversity of the population in the U.S. All right. Okay, a little more practical here. I think we're going to need to to go. How can we help identify suitable haplotypes for cold weather beekeeping? Please tell us how. So local selection, how we do local selection. So uh, yeah, this is this is an interesting question. So first, we need to take advantage of what the nature provided us with, because um, nature has been working on the evolution of all the subspecies, uh, all organism in life, for millions of years. So now we can expect that uh, the West Mediterranean lineage, for example, or the haplotype that are located in the northern area of Europe, would or the M lineage, let's say, would be more adapted to the to a colder climate than subspecies located in North Africa on the Mediterranean or or the North Mediterranean lineage. Uh, it, it, that's that's a logic answer. Why? Because if they during their evolution and the, after the the second glaciation, when they moved from one pocket and they invaded all this area, they went there and they were they were accumulating the genes needed to survive the climate up till the northern area. So those they are already providing us with an answer that you know I'm a native guy from this land. I can sustain the hardship of whatever you throw at yeah. me because I've been here for millions of years. So we can start from this um, uh, logic, and then we need we need studies, and we need to stop this mixing, the random mixing, because the random mixing is not sustainable. It's like punctual. You can get like something good, but you want some. You want a, a sustainable beekeeping activity, and then you want to preserve also the 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 um, the, um, uh, the the subspecies you have. Uh, Worldwide, in fact, it's not just a, a country issue. It's not like just within a specific border of a country. So we can start from there. We can start from checking the subspecies that are, uh, they may not produce very well honey, you know, or they may have some issues, but their local adaptation will give you more probability of survival and well-being and uh, then having a single boost of honey and then they collapse, for example. Uh, similarly, we can mimic that and start, to, but we need a lot of studies, in fact, on that. Uh, we can uh, take the subspecies that are that evolved in a specific climate in the old world and then put them in the same context. And that is the, the, the example I, I, uh, I mentioned about Syriaca when I saw uh, some uh, uh, Z haplotype, Z haplotype in, in Texas. Exactly. I was thinking, yeah, people must probably, people when the immigrant, when they move, they said, okay, you know, this subspecies is the climate is similar. Maybe uh, the, the subspecies of my native uh, town will do good here. So this is, this is the way how I, I see that we can start something like this. But, but we need scientific uh, studies to, to really prove that and document everything that uh, we can see in terms of adaptation. Well, every time we talk about this, oh, the way I think in my logic, I remember the logic that happened in Brazil. <laughs> so with the Africanized bee. So we need to be careful with that, with this. Oh, yeah, let's see this African climate here. The bees might be better in the climate in Brazil and see what. And then we end up with the way we are in South America right now. 
Okay, so I, I want to conclude, uh, Mohammed, asking about other projects that you are working on now that people perhaps should be paying attention. Maybe something that coming in the future, things to interesting things. So, coming. Uh, yeah. So currently, we are um, uh, in, in that similar front. Uh, what we are doing is we are um, establishing some. Uh, we are studying basically these same samples. We are studying the paternal heredity of of these samples because we've got a, we yes. we have the DNA extracted ready. We have those thousand sixty two, I guess, a sample. Now we want to see now what what we uh, talked about today is the maternal heredity. What is coming from the queen? The maternal line, uh, uh, lines. Now we want to see. Okay, uh, we want basically to shed more light on the DCA diversity. So those queens, they've met with many drones or maybe one or two or maybe more. Uh, we want to see what diversity is coming, what paternal heredity was brought to, to these colonies. And we are using uh, microsatellite markers to um, conduct an analysis on those samples and see if we have a better diversity coming from the drones or fathers, if you want. So this is usually how we, we conduct this type of, of, of study uh, in, in the genetic analysis of bees, is that we track first the, the maternal lineage, and then we see if better gene, better diversified uh, loci or genes are coming from the paternal side or not. So we're con we conducting that currently. And then, as I said also before, in terms of diversity and queen project, what we are doing, we are working with queen producers. They uh, supplied us with, with sample from their operation. And we are trying to see what genetic pool they have, if it is similar to what we uh, see with the other US beekeepers or not. Because maybe, maybe some queen producers, they have higher diversity they have haplotypes that we uh, that were not widely spread within the operation of beekeepers nationwide, and those will help to identify uh, those um, uh, queen producers and help them uh, boost their um, their diversity and their business as well. So, uh, so those those two um, aspects on on um, on queen lines and diversity we're working on currently in my lab. Interesting. Lots of good things coming from. Beltsville lab in Maryland, close here, my first B lab that I work. Yeah, I miss that place. Mohammed, I want to thank you very much for your time here today with us. Uh, I, I definitely learned a lot today, and I'm looking forward to see more good things coming from your lab. I always learn a lot with you. Well, thank you very much, Humberto, for having me, and thank you very much for your audience, and hope it was like informative, and uh, reach out to me or Humberto if you have any question. We are here to serve, uh, so we are here to save problems for beekeepers. We are beekeepers. We understand the pain that we are all facing, in fact, and we want really to to identify the issues, tackle the issues at hand, and make the beekeeping uh, practice in, in, in the U.S. better for everyone uh, and also help our bees survive for pollination and for the ecosystem uh, in general so this is this is what we do and uh, thank you very much for listening thank you mohammed thank you. and i want to thank you guys at home for being here with me and mohammed is for one hour and and half talking about bees it's always fun to have you guys here if you have extra questions sorry if i missed some of the questions send the questions to me uh via my email or or, or patreon or Wherever you can find me, I will try to answer them. And if I don't know, I will, I will send them to Mohammed. And Mohammed, take care of the job. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. And a good night to everybody. And I'll see you guys in the next video inside the Hive.tv, the show about bees. See you guys next week. Bye-bye.